Welcome back to the Last Lap Podcast, post Qatar Grand Prix edition. I'm once again joined by JB Law James from the live stream. Links to these three down in the description below if you're watching on YouTube, of course. What do we think race rating first, lads? Get, let's get some numbers out there, okay? Because there was a lot of overtakes. There was a lot going on. Was there a... The McLaren's were close to Max as well at the front. They were. I would say, for me, it was definitely an 8 out of 10 for me because for me I love the strategy side of things so to see all the cerebral thinking that everything's not set in stone and potentially things just go completely the opposite direction on the next lap so for me this was my jam I was thinking oh yeah okay there's something to actually think about there's always something processing in the back of my mind mm. who's going to be going where instead of for the longest time you usually get to about like 10 15 laps and you think oh we're in the procession right now. And yeah, there was a lot, a lot of processing yeah, needed yeah. for this one, I think. Yeah. The complexity, though, it added to it for definite. But also, we were at points in the race like, we can't really mm. tell who's going to be where. We didn't know who was really battling with who. And then it kind of came together all at the end with five laps left to go. And it was like, oh, they're actually yeah. in the points. And they're it was not quite hard the to points. follow. True. Yeah. And that once, once we got towards the end, I mean, things kind of, you know, they kind of channeled and, and that's almost the most exciting bit is when all the strategies come together. But it almost felt like it could have delivered more at the front, maybe, and, and with those sort of podium positions. And in the end, I mean, maybe because at the first corner, the two Mercedes decided to take each other out, which is which, which kind of maybe ruined a little <laughs> bit of what could have been a great race for second, third, fourth, fifth between the two Mercedes and two McLaren. Yeah. So I think uh, for me, I'd say an eight is probably a little bit generous. I'd probably say maybe a six and a half or a seven. I mean, it was, it was good. There was plenty of going on mm. but it it almost felt like the potential was there to be an all-timer and it just didn't it, it never quite you know it never quite got going i guess in terms of that yeah, yeah. That big fight that we were we were hoping I, for i think i think a seven is probably fair yeah and no, i would say that's fair overall if you take things it's, it's an eight for me based on the stats but i'd say seven is perfectly reasonable yeah because we, we say, got... considering the sprint was only 19 laps the sprint felt more entertaining at yeah times. oh yeah, that like it had a little sprint. bit more going yeah. on. And yeah. There was maybe a bit more kind of jeopardy going on in the sprint race, whereas the race itself, as you said, as soon as we lost the Mercedes, which surely has to be where we kind of start. Yeah, it was an interesting one so. for Lewis Hamilton to go around the outside, although he has taken full responsibility, which is quite nice. I will, uh, Lewis. I know, will quote his, his tweet. Up. Um, I've watched the replay and it was 100% my fault and I take full responsibility. Apologies to my team and to George. So accountability for sure. I mean. Yeah, I think on the initial eye test, it was hard to judge from the camera angle. But once you saw the onboards, I mean, there was nothing more Russell could have done. Hamilton had tarmac to his left. And it kind of, again, similar to that uh, incident with him and Alonso in Spa, where he's overtaken on the outside and just kind of makes contact when there is still space to the left. So, yeah, not great from Lewis. Um, disappointing because a big opportunity for him to get close that gap to Checo as well. Yeah. Um, I like to think with Lewis putting his hands up, this should, and George getting a decent result P4 in the end, this shouldn't, but this is happening quite a bit this year between the two of them. And I don't know, mm. I think Toto giving these two both a two-year contract, James, that's a bit, it's a yeah, bit, yeah. Yeah. It, 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 they, they kind of sort of maybe need to establish who's, who is the number one in the team, because if they get involved in a title fight with another team, they will take, surely they can't cover. do that. Surely that ship's out. Well, unfortunately, they've, they've, they've done that and they, they, they're they going to struggle because they're going to take points off each other. Yeah. They will at some point hit each other if they're in a title fight. I mean, they already have, and I know and the, the, ra the ramifications here are smaller because somehow they still managed to outscore Ferrari. They they were presented Impressive. with an open goal, missed it, and still got two more points than Ferrari. So yeah. um, they're fortunate that their gap to McLaren is sufficient that they probably in the last five races will be okay. Yeah. But um, yeah, they uh, they had an open goal today, um, starting on the well second and third, uh, and they they did kind of miss it. Um, mm -hmm. And it's the second weekend in a row that those two have well. Did they, they? They got perilously close to touching each other in Japan, and here um, they've paid the ultimate price with one car in the gravel trap at, uh, in the exit of turn one. So um, it, they, they, uh, they're going to have to have some big, big talks because they've got to keep a lid on this just for the team's sake more than anything. That second in the constructors is so valuable; there's a huge amount of cash riding on it, and yes. for them, um, their their two their two drivers taking each other out is not what they need in this moment. Yeah, I feel like the narrative that George was pitched when he arrived at Mercedes has changed completely because there may have been a clear path of Lewis maybe making way for George to lead the team but now that Lewis has actually extended George is now thinking well 
well, what's my place on the team then? So throughout the entire year, George has been a man in a hurry, much like Charles at Ferrari yeah. is the man in a hurry to prove something. Lando to a lesser extent, but it's really George and Charles I find a lot in common, that they're trying to justify their position of being put on this pedestal. Mercedes are putting George as the future, or at least they were, and George is desperately in the races trying to go, look, I can think on the fly. Um, let me try this out. I just want to see if this will work. And the team just don't have quite that much confidence in him to actually pull it off. And most of the time, Mercedes, they're right that George's idea won't work. Well, they were right in the sprint when he wanted to pick. That's, saying, yeah. that's what I'm saying. That's the thing. That's the kicker is that George's plans wouldn't work. So George is now scrabbling around trying to figure out what's my definition here? What, what's my motivation? What am I supposed to do? Yeah. And you felt like actually in the sprint and the qualifying, he had calmed down. But now it's just a case of, ooh, not quite so sure about that. Because this is a headache, lads. Like, yeah, it is. This is... They've signed up for two more years of this, mm. Mercedes. And, you know, I I've said this before. I feel like if Mercedes get the car to fight at the front, they are surely going to feel obliged, a sense of obligation on themselves, given what happened in 21, to give Lewis and, and prioritise and want Lewis to get that 8-4 title at Mercedes because that will reflect... If Lewis does get 8, he will be then statistically, in terms of the most titles of all time ahead of Schumacher mm. um, and that will reflect positively on Mercedes they've given George this kind of I mean we saw you know last year he outscored Lewis and there was a lot of potential factors for that but he the whole time he's been close to Lewis they're qualifying head to heads they're the like one of the closest pairings I don't know how they go forward from because George is clearly an incredible talent mm -hmm. and when you look at how old Lewis is and how much longer his career is going to be and, you know, age is just a number, yes, but Lewis will eventually retire. George has got years left in the tank. But then they've given George this open, but then but then Lewis still wants to stay and win an 8-4 title and he believes in Mercedes and he wants that 8-4 title. Others, like, what, what's the point? That's the only reason Lewis is here is to win an 8-4 title. He's done everything else. So like, how do they, how do Mercedes move forward? Like, JB, if you're in charge, what do you do? If you're Toto Wolf? What do you do? I don't because I don't is, know. It's it's continually ramping. I feel like George Russell had a nice season last season where just being consistent, especially where Lewis was playing around with the setup quite a lot of that Mercedes. He obviously finished ahead of him in the standings. Now hmm. this season, it's almost been a little bit of a reality check for George Russell. Yes. Like he's made that mistake in Canada, which is the one that I come back to, where it was just all on his own and he hit the wall. And then, you know, Singapore was another one where it was like a lot of people were saying after that race, could Lewis have won it? if George wasn't in the way with yep. Lando Norris and Carlos Sainz just in front of Hamilton, like I'd have backed Hamilton more than Russell to get past those two, whether or not he'd have been able to do it. And it also does feel like just in the last few races, George has had the, the benefit of better qualifying. Hamilton said himself recently that his qualifying needs to get better, but Hamilton still has the edge in terms of race pace. So what they're having at the moment is even though George starts slightly ahead, Hamilton's right there in the race. And it almost gets mm. to the point where, as you said, they back themselves into a corner where they can't really be like George Hamilton's the number one driver. Yeah, you yeah. could let him by, please. Like we see it with Sergio Perez all the time. Like Verstappen, whenever he's anywhere near him, Sergio, move out of the way. Like they can't mm. really say that to George. It's a problem because George is quick enough. And that's the to point. hang with Lewis. Like, with Mercedes now, the two year contract, there's nothing they can do. No. I don't think they can convince George that. If he's right there with Lewis Hamilton, he has to give way to him. And then no, no, in no imagination are they ever going to convince Lewis Hamilton to move out of the way for George no. Russell. No. So it's Come just, on. They've got themselves in this situation. There's nothing they can really do. And it's just going to get to the point where if they are on the same piece of track, they're going to fight each other. Yeah. Hmm. I think they're going to have to suck it up and just be like, look, we, we've made the decision to pick two of the five strongest drivers on the grid. I mean, how it doesn't matter how you rank them. Two of the six, say, if you include, say, other, others being Verstappen, Leclerc, Alonso, and Norris. We've got two of the six best drivers on the grid, both in our cars. We expect the maximum. And if at some point it, it boils over, we're going to have to accept it, knowing that the points that they will have made up being, you know, George being that much better than, say, who they had before in Bottas, um, that, that percentage over the course of the season will mean that if we do have a blowout, we'll still be getting getting uh, more points than um than one than we would have would have with a with a lesser driver or with a better team player or an, an, a number one and a number two in that scenario so 
they've they've got to they're going to have to try and balance it some way. They've made their bed exactly, and now yeah. they're going to have to lie in it. And um, yeah, I think I think they have to suck it up because uh, they, that's exactly what they've done for two more years. And at some point. Um, if they get the car that requires them to the championship, these two are going to take points off each other. I think there was maybe a little bit of an assumption from Mercedes, especially when they got Russell into that Williams seat and obviously he was contracted at Williams for three years. I think they expected Hamilton to probably have those eight titles. I don't yeah, know if possibly. they saw 2021 coming in the way that it did. And therefore, in their minds, they probably thought Hamilton will have eight. Maybe he'll do one more year yeah. and then he'll move across. Whereas because Hamilton didn't win that eighth title, kind of got the race that he wanted, almost like with Verstappen right now. Verstappen talks about the fact that he isn't really that enthusiastic about Formula One because it's too easy to an extent. Hamilton kind of had the same thing where if yeah, he'd have won that possibly. eighth title, if it had been super easy, he walked mm. to an eighth title, would he have been that enthusiastic about staying around for like that much mm. longer? No. Whereas now he's had a title battle with Verstappen. He knows the Mercedes car can get maybe back towards that Red Bull. He's got a little bit of a challenge back again. Mm. And it's kind of reinvigorated Hamilton yeah. to be like, I'm going to stay for another couple of years. I'm going to see yeah. what this Mercedes can do. I agree. And as far as he's concerned, he's seen the likes of Fernando Alonso come back and some of his um, physios saying that actually Fernando is fitter than he was back in 2012 or something like that. And he's thinking, well, it's possible. There's no nothing really physically stopping me at the moment. I don't feel like I'm slowing down. So Lewis has got the drive to, no pun intended, um, <laughs> carry on. Yeah. George is now being thwarted and thinking, well, how long have I, he may extend this contract again he may just keep going until he gets his eighth title and then george may think well what's my place here well, and then eventually you're going to get young mercedes drivers like kimi antonelli yep. frederick vesti coming in maybe starting to stir the pot and then george might be looking over his shoulder going mm. maybe an emergency jump if lando goes to red bull to mclaren maybe i think right time right right place right time if yeah a lot of this sport Russell Piastri, 2026. The thing is, like, Russell spent, say, three years in a Williams. He's thought, you know, on that lie detector thing, he was like, I should have only had one at Williams. Like, he believes he should have got that shot soon. And look, I get it from George. Again, he spent all that time in the Williams, see, seeing Lewis take these world titles. As soon as he gets a shot, he gets the W13, which was absolute awful car. Yeah. Awful car. True. He waits all that time, finally gets there, does get the win, fine. But then Lewis isn't buggering off and he's like, oh, I forgot. I wanted my own Bottas. And now he's got Lewis Hamilton, like, arguably the greatest of all time, as his teammate, which he's going to learn a lot from having Lewis as teammate. But you know what? Like, when I just think long term, I think the team and particularly the driver who's looking at this situation and the McLaren situation, which I think we'll get onto next, most in the best possible way is Red Bull and Max Verstappen because they are the only team pairing, okay, maybe with Alonso Stroll, Aston Martin, but Aston Martin aren't showing enough right now. You look at Ferrari's partnership, Leclerc and Science, they get on pretty well. Mm. They're very close. We saw that in Monza, almost bubble over. I mean, if Carlos literally forced Leclerc off the track and didn't get a penalty, I still don't know how that didn't happen, but they were very close to a shunt. You had, again, we just talked about um, Lewis and George, and then obviously Lando and Oscar being super close. Max has got a comfortable number two in Perez. He's got the best car right now, which isn't just going to fall off a cliff next year. Like this still looks great from a championship winning point of view. We saw it in 2007 with McLaren tripping over each other, other Hamilton, Alonso, and then Kimi was just like, He's just going, no, what do, 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 do I win? I'll take win. it. Oh, okay. I'll take it. And he took okay. it. <laughs> and that's the thing, right? So I, I think we, we talked about this in the stream. You, When you take on two number ones, you are asking for trouble yeah. challenging time and you look at mclaren right now oscar you know he's had this race 17 18 yeah, whatever 17th it is. race i think L like think what he's going to be like in you know after race 30 after race 50 like this kid's rate of development is very good and lando had a great first season you know he beat science in qualifying that first year out which was no kind of mean feat but like this is a like lando they're, they're, they're keeping it cool Mm. They're keeping it cool right now. And Lando was a bit like, he, you can tell he wasn't too happy. And like we've talked about, you know, is it getting in his head maybe that Oscar's taken this first race win? I certainly think from an external pressure, it's what a lot of people are talking about. But how do McLaren stop this turning into a Mercedes-esque 
situation. It's tough, isn't it? I think they have the benefit of Oscar being a rookie this season. Yes. You know, when George came into the team with the Mercedes kind of outlook, he'd already been at Williams for three years. So he was ready to like pounce into a team. Mm. Because it's Oscar's rookie year, he's still getting to grips with quite a lot of things going on in Formula One. Like this is the first time that he's raced in Qatar. Mm. He's still learning a lot of the tracks. His tire degradation isn't still the best in races. We're still learning that. I feel like McLaren have kind of got away with it. And the fact that Lando Norris is still quite a chunk of points ahead in the standings right now, that it's two seasons time is where I completely agree. I think we could see Lando and Oscar get closer and closer and closer. And it's then what happens. I think they just have to be really clear very early on. If they're going to choose Lando to be the number one, they kind of have to tell Oscar that sooner rather than later. I don't think they can get to the point where they're basically colliding with one another in a couple of seasons time yeah. and then McLaren out of nowhere go actually Oscar if you could be the number two for this season mm. I think they they have to outline or at least a plan although that doesn't always go great like we heard from uh, Alpine that they had to rejig their plan after Suzuka because they let they let Pierre through Pierre was not happy to let Ocon back oh, pass oh. and even in the midfield you see when you've got driver pairings that are close to one another yeah it does get to that point of tension. Yeah. And it, it's just, an, it feels inevitable with McLaren in the same way, doesn't it? It definitely does. I mean, with the Ocon situation, is that it doesn't really help when Ocon goes, well, well that's just the way we've done things. I don't understand what Gavin's <laughs> talking about. I mean, it's just the thing with the seniority, but going with McLaren, it's like, you feel like McLaren right now, they're, they're, in, they're ambivalent, as in like, oh my God, we've got the best driver lineup on the grid. It's like, we've got the best driver. Oh, right <laughs> and also yeah. they're going like yeah we there's this bit from a bug to life i'm just thinking oscar p2 in a 17th race this is not supposed to happen not right now it's like they haven't got a plan but if there are, is there's any team that can handle team orders it's mclaren because they have seen it happen time and time again throughout their history they know how to handle it and but I does experience guarantee because not n n name me one time a team at the very front has managed two alpha drivers and and, and it not gone sour i mean even look at when uh, vettel came in at red bull alongside weber and you know weber was leading that 2010 championship going into the last race and then vettel came in and multi-21 and all this happened not bad for a number two driver was that season as Istanbul. well Istanbul. yeah yeah and big crash um, yeah no, that's true that is a very good point but it, 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 are we asking the impossible but therefore, the, the teams need to accept that if you're going to take on these two, and this is where Red Bull are in a fantastic position, like I say. Yeah, but, you know, I, I think it's a good, um, I think Oscar's great insurance for McLaren. It is. Because He's insurance policy. If Lando is to go to Red Bull, we know they've been flirting with him big time. And, you know, whether or not that happens, I think drivers need to be, Lando knows the kind of driver he's got as a teammate now. And he knows that it's only going to improve from Oscar's point of view. And do you want to be in a position like, you know, say Fernando and Lewis in 2007? Again, they, that was different because Lewis was a fresh rookie coming in fighting for a title. But ultimately, them two being too competitive with each other meant that neither of them won anything. Mm. So I just, I, I, I look at Oscar and I look at how, his mentality and how good he is, how how quickly he's been so good and, and I like to think that these two will play it smart for the have played it smart this year because they were just like we're miles back what's the point in fighting what's the mm. point in like scrapping and taking points off of each other and and Oscar wasn't close enough I, I don't think at the start of the year to, to give Lando too many issues but mm. I think you look at a team like Alpine I just think it's it's petulant like Gasly and Ocon like that that because like you, you're fighting for like try and build the team forward because you're not going to win anything no one's going to win anything without the best car yeah you know? mm. I mean and I think for McLaren I think at the moment it's like a credit to Oscar that he's not sort of driving out of himself no the fact that he's been so reserved and so kind of strong in his development path but not being like over ambitious with it I think that's a credit to him and that maybe kind of 
for McLaren, that gives him a little bit less of a headache, knowing that he's he's not going to be overzealous and he's he's a, he's a very sort of controlled, methodical, and a, just a really brilliant driver in this moment. So whilst they might start getting a headache when he, you know, I mean, even today, Lando was saying we go, you know, I should I should go past, and um, when Oscar was ahead, I mean, we haven't we haven't almost seen the flip of that yet, and Oscar kind of pushing as Lando is like to be like to like request to be the number one almost, mm-hmm. um, whereas you know Lando is asking that, whereas Oscar. Has, has only ever just been ahead and it's been the other way around. So I think that's a credit to Oscar in that the fact he's just had his head down and he, he's unfazed. And mm. I think the fact that he's totally unflappable yeah. might be, it might stand McLaren in good stead knowing that they, they've got that kind of a little bit of flexibility there with the, the fact that Oscar just just has that, that cool temperament that knowing that he knows where he stands, he, he backs his talent right as, as far as it can possibly go because we know he knows in his own head just how good he is and you know people are starting to realize that now so I, I think for McLaren they might have a better chance of keeping a lid on it than say Mercedes do because at the moment Mercedes are all at sea and yeah. figuring yes. out how they deal I think, with yeah, it. I think Oscar's personality lends definitely seems yeah. to from the outside looking yeah. in, it seems to lend to him versus George's character where he's like I've been here in Williams for three years, you know, shitter at the back, like, give me a car now, I, I want this. And I, I understand that impatience. Like, Russian drivers aren't known for their patience at the end of the day. But <laughs> but I do I do ultimately do think this does all kind of play into Red Bull's hands. I think if, yeah, if you're Christian Horner and you're looking at this and you're being like, I've got a clear one too, like, you've got these other teams that look like the most likely to compete with us and they're... Mm. they're, they're yeah. Their teammates are scrapping over each other. Well, I mean, that's why we're seeing Sergio Perez stay next season, right? Like, yeah. uh, well, at least what it looks like at the moment. Obviously, Red Bull and drivers are always very difficult <laughs> to predict. True. But at this moment in time, like, there's been so many rumors, and Sergio Perez hasn't had a great season. Don't get me wrong. And there's been so many times that people have said he's surely not good enough. He's surely not good enough. Whilst Red Bull are winning constructors' championships and winning drivers' championships. They won't really mind that. That's much. no. That's why you keep him. Yeah. <laughs> you keep him because he's not good enough to get close to Max. Yeah, like like surely we're we, we're seeing that now. If and you want to fire the front, you need a one two. They've got the luxury of having the strong car that even um, even how it's going. I mean, last year that they they finished one two in the standings. So I oh, know they did not obviously missed out by a point. So I mean, they're pretty much done. They're, they're getting pretty much the maximum of what they need. And, and there's no reason why they'd upset the apple cart by by putting in, um, you know, by bringing in Lando Norris. I mean, because we might, we don't know how Verstappen would react to that. I mean, he might not. He, he I'm sure, he, sure he wouldn't be very favourable in all those kind of engineering meetings. And I know that lots of drivers have tried to challenge Verstappen. In the end, it's why Ricardo left because ultimately he just knew that he couldn't kind of deal with that week in week out and 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 the favouritism going one way or the other. And so that there's just this Red Bull just doesn't work. The, just the culture simply doesn't. Why work give themselves having, the headache? Yeah, the culture just doesn't work with having two number ones. And and for them, they they can they never get has through them. life with with only. With having a one and a two and that's fine yeah but the five years of the wilderness years for daniel ricardo coming back in 2025 is that red bull view him as potentially a good perez but maybe even better as in he could in theory be a locked in shoe in for p2 no questions Mm. and now daniel's just happy to be there he's just happy that oh i threw this away Oh no, I got it back. And that, and Christian Horner is happy as well because he's the Daniel Ricciardo is one of the few drivers that got away and Christian's yeah. kicking himself for doing that. They they offered him a lot of money to stay and it still didn't refuse. But now Christian's going, got him back. Well, look, down to me. I, I, I think a season like this, Perez is the perfect number two. Like Max is winning the constructors on his own. Yes. You know, so I, I think that the the argument against Perez for like next year is assuming that say Mercedes get a closer car to them, Ferrari, McLaren, then the fact that Checo isn't close enough, like people can work against Max. Mm-hmm. Everyone will be closer to Max and therefore take more points and you won't be able to utilize that second driver in terms yeah. of strategy, undercuts, blah, blah, blah. That's where it potentially becomes an issue. It's not an issue right now, yeah. but it could be an issue. That's but I the think thing. you make a great point that they've got Daniel Ricciardo in the wings. Yeah. yeah, they could quite hap- I feel like Red Bull would quite happily say 10 races into next season, similar to what happened with Nick De Vries, Sergio Perez, maybe they're second in the drive uh, sorry, they're second in the constructors championship. Yeah, they can be um, patient. Max Verstappen's got 100 odd points and Sergio Perez only got 20 odd and they're like, "You know what? The swap now. Yeah. Daniel Ricciardo comes in now." Yeah. And it's Hi like, guys. Little... <laughs> <laughs> All right, fellas. <laughs> Back in the game. It's, it's, and then, you it's know an upgrade that, on Perez yeah, without... And, and also, it's a 
I, I viewed it in several of my videos in that this is the the moment of Red Bull. They've got a lot of negative press. They've had all the stuff with Helmut Marco. They've had all of the Perez bashing. They've had Max just say everyone saying, oh, he's killing F1 with the domination, even though we know domination is cyclical in the sport. But now they're thinking, well, what's one good news story that we could bring Daniel Ricciardo? Put Daniel Ricciardo back in the seat. Everyone will like that. But then again, I feel like after what Liam Lawson has done, you feel like Daniel comes up, hey, Bert, I'm back. And then you hear crickets. You feel like, actually, Liam's done not pretty well here. And you've. Daniel needs to earn it. He needs to earn it. He needs to earn it. Absolutely. This is what I think this will help him in 2024 because he has driven the RB19. And we've heard from Helmut Marco that he basically wants to make the AT05 or whatever it's going to be called practically as much as an RB19 as pos as physically possible and legally possible. Mm. So Daniel would have had that experience in that car. So you feel like they're primed and ready. They're just going to be telling Daniel, just wait, we'll just wait. We'll see what Checo does. Yeah. Ideally, I want Checo to see out his contract and go like, you know what? I've done. Peace. I'm out. I'm but it, it, it's out. hard to let... It's hard to Checo finished 80 seconds behind Max today. That, yeah. is, that is telling. And with Ten. a five-second penalty. Two five-second penalty. Oh, that's be, yeah, and yeah, this ten-second yeah. penalty at the beginning. Yeah. So, yeah, you got to, like... So, on raw pace, a minute. It's a second and a lap slower. Yeah. Which is, which is I mean, in, if, if, they're in a, yeah. if they're in a close fight, it's, it's almost like, what do Red Bull value more? Do they value winning the Drivers' Championship... Or do they value winning the constructors' championship? And they can't want both. Yeah, but drivers, unfortunately, come on, it's oh, drivers. Well, it's, I mean, it's got to be. But um, but you know, for for them, like, I mean, in 2021, it was quite clear that when Perez was chasing um for some points at Silverstone, they reeled him in for the fastest lap because for Max, that was the mm. one taking a point off Hamilton. So I mean, I, I know for 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 the whole team, like having the drivers' championship is just that much better. But in terms of financial point of view, I mean, a constructors' championship is worth that much more as yeah, well. But yeah. I mean, ideally you would then win both, but they can't really. Ideally, uh, they can't yeah. really be sort of l lagging behind with with a driver that's, that's you know not scoring like he did today. Yeah, especially with the research of McLaren, that's twenty six to thirty three points that Red Bull versus McLaren have scored this week. And if that's that's every week, that does pose a headache for Red Bull. Yeah, and it but, dominates the headlines as well. And, and again, yeah. like sponsorship, like that Oracle deal that Red Bull signed, it was worth. I know it's like hundreds of millions or at least a hundred hundred million that you know the merit that comes from f1 is who wins the driver's title like that the sponsors are not looking at oh you won the constructor so technically you were the best team no but when you think about 2021 you think about max verstappen winning that title in the circumstances you don't think about mercedes winning that eighth constructor's title like, that's just not what like yes constructor's title you get a bit more prize money but like the value of a driver's title for sure, like versus, you know, Max winning, if if he could have swapped it round, so Lewis won the title, Red Bull won the constructors versus what actually happened, 100% Red Bull were getting more than that 12 million offset in terms of endorsements, in terms of eyeballs on Red yeah. Bull as a brand for Max winning. All of the, the, all of the Max Verstappen like world title 2021 merchandise and all of the stuff that comes with that, the unmeasurables of marketing, like... Yeah. That that's what they're going for, and we saw in twenty one as well. By the way, it was the other way around. Perez was the, Perez played a pivotal role in that championship, and Bottas was nowhere no. to help out Hamilton. He was losing a place, a, a corner at Baku. Like Bottas could have and should have been there to back up Hamilton, and he wasn't. That gap was too big, and that's what you know. That, this is what I'm concerned about with Aston Martin, right? Because say mm. Aston Martin do what they did at the start of this year, next year, right, and they turn out out the gates in 2024 with a fantastic car. They've got Fernando Alonso, who we know didn't have a great weekend this weekend, but we know like he's got that dog in him still, right? He can still do it. But that gap to Stroll is like egregiously big at the minute. And you've got Stroll pushing his like people around in the, and like out in Q1, like every single race. Like there is such thing as well as like their, that gap being too big. And yeah. I think when you look at Aston Martin and Stroll, like, it's getting pretty untenable. And that's when the Constructors Championship matters because that's potentially tens of millions of dollars thrown away in prize money. And you feel like that eventually the shareholders are going to be going like, well, you do realize, Aston Martin, you are losing money in terms of the company. This extra prize money is not only good for prestige for the sponsors, but it's also good for your bottom line to help you out. In my video, post-Japan, if Aston Martin had two strolls, 
they'd be behind Alpine in the consensus. Yeah, oh, for sure. And that's that's damning. The same number of points, but that, with that a lower, car, higher. At one position. point, was the second fastest car for the first, for the flyaway races at the beginning of the season. Mm. You feel that shouldn't be. And, and we said we said this about Joe on the live stream when Joe joined Alfa Romeo. It was a good car at the start, and yeah. he was a rookie, and he he wasn't at the level to capitalize. Yeah. And now the car's terrible. Yeah. Same for Aston Martin. Season start. This is Stroll's seventh season. Yeah. Yeah. In Formula I mean, One. You can take the broken wrist into account a little bit when it was maybe, the strongest, yeah. but maybe for the first two or three. After that, still, Alonso, Alonso picked up podiums right all the way up until Canada, I think. Mm. So, I mean, I mean, there's. But yeah, Stroll, there's, Stroll was good with the wrist. Like, yeah, he had a yeah, broken wrist. Stroll, Stroll, if anything, started the season better I with mean, the broken wrist. Yeah. Yeah. I still remember him overtaking yeah. Russell with like yeah. one hand. With a, broken, with a broken wrist and P6, you, everyone was thinking, Oh, that's hardcore. Yeah, wow. and Saudi Arabia went, 2 went, went around with the outside of science. Yeah. Like, yeah. Great start. Yeah, he was like, on it. And then the car broke down and not, not his fault. That's yeah. Not, yeah, it's not his fault. It's a, it's a confidence thing with Lance yeah. Stroll at this moment in time. Isn't it? It's fully mentally, yeah. he's just lost where he's at in that team. I think at the beginning of the season, Fernando Alonso came in. There was a lot of hype around the Aston Martin car. And if anything, he'd have been quite happy to see Fernando Alonso get those podiums. Obviously, a little bit envious, but he would have been like, oh, Aston Martin, we're here. We've arrived. Now it's Fernando Alonso has arrived. He's dragging that Aston Martin to victories and Lance Stroll is being berated every single Grand Prix. And yeah. he can't get away from it at this point. Yeah. He, whether he's in the garage, he has to see Fernando Alonso every single race pulling out points for Aston Martin, wherever he's looking at the media, in the press... Everywhere he looks, he is getting berated from all sides. And even in qualifying, we saw completely lost his head. Mm. You can just see it completely bubbling over for him. And it's at a point now where he's almost pushing so hard, he's getting less out of the car mm. and it's just going to spiral. He's pushing harder. His performances are getting worse and worse. He's pushing harder. Even in the race in Qatar, he could have finished in the points, then gets a five-second penalty. Yep. Yep. Pushes it too hard once again and misses out on those points. And Fernando Alonso comfortably finishing in the points. Basically didn't see Fernando Alonso in Qatar because yeah. he was just so consistent and so happy with where he was. For Lance Stroll, for me, I know that it's a, a guaranteed seat because of the relationship that he has with the team and the way that his dad is involved. But for him... I'm worried about his actual, like, just mental health yeah, yeah, yeah. at this point. Yeah. Like, outbursts does seem... like that are not conducive of like, he look, a he positive. Looks completely, he looks completely finished, place. doesn't he? I mean, his his body language, his persona just looks deflated. He looks lost. I mean, his interview on Friday was seven words. His interview on Saturday was 17 words. So that's that's an increase. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a slightly larger jump, but really, yeah. I mean, and... We, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but I mean, it's just the psychological effect that all these, I mean, what we've seen in 2023 is the psychological effect that different teammates have been having on each other. I mean, we can pretty much go through about half the grid and the effect that Stroll's had on, uh, Alonso's had on Stroll, that Stroll has been broken and Verstappen's had on Perez that um, after Miami, you know, Perez could have been leading the championship had he gone from pole to victory. And in the end, Verstappen went from 15th to first and uh, and almost schooled Sergio Perez. And, and that gave him a big hit. And, you know, you see George Russell suddenly realizing that, oh, oh goodness, that that's not, it's not quite how uh, I was expecting this to go. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I think for Lance Stroll, maybe for his own sake, he just needs to take a step back and, mm. um, and maybe sort of reevaluate him and then, and then maybe either take a year off or come back or do something else. Because at this point, you know, you, you do, you almost feel sorry for him because it's just, it just really just something is just not clicking. And it, and as you say, it's going to spiral out of control. I mean, he's getting worse. He looks completely deflated as well. So, and, and I think especially coming off the back of last year where he was pretty close to Vettel. Like the qualifying deficit was within a tenth and a half. Um, yeah, Vettel outscored him, but like relative pace, he was not getting slapped around left, like mm. week in, week out like he is right now. And it's one of them, once the, yeah, once it, it's kind of a self-fulfilling thing, right? It, it, you, you get your confidence down, you get hard on yourself and you push too hard. We're seeing it kind of with Sargent as well. Mm -hmm. um, but again, Stroll is a, an experienced F1 driver. Like for years, I would I would give him concessions because he's still only young. But actually, not like his first season was 2017. Yeah. 2017. Yeah. Like, come on. He got that podium and everyone's thinking, wow, he's really good. And you know what? I feel like he'd be driving better if he was not driving a team owned by his dad. 
Because those two years at Williams, maybe he was more on it and focused. Because maybe. yeah, sure, Stroll was partially invested in that team, but yeah, his son, you know, there was the th the sort there was this thing going like, we could fire you if you don't perform. There was that little bit of jeopardy. But now, since Racing Point, there's been no jeopardy at all. So he's been cushy, and he's been except for 2020 when he had the pink Mercedes, which is pretty much it, really. He he got his confidence. He got the podium in Monza. Yeah, it was an absolute barnstormer of a race. But yeah, he still got P3. He still got the result. He got the pole in Turkey. Mm. He got results. And you feel like, oh, okay. Took a little while, but he's here. But then the Aston Martin years have just been like, where? Yeah. Where's he gone? I sometimes feel that his actual, the fact that he's been in Formula 1 for seven years kind of plays against him because he's had to witness... George Russell come in, Leclerc come in, Norris come in, and all of the adulation go towards them. Mm. Oh, yeah. Lance Stroll's never had that. Like, even when he did get the pole position, it was just kind of a one-off. No one was like, this is the coming of Lance Stroll. Lance mm. Stroll's now going to get linked to Mercedes or Red Bull. That's never really happened. Whereas he's seen George Russell come in and get a slot at a Mercedes. He's seen Lando Norris come in and become the number one at McLaren. He's seen Charles Leclerc come in and displace Sebastian yeah. Vettel. Like, you got, he's been in there and now is getting to the point where he was like, maybe he thought in a similar vein to Leclerc when Vettel left Ferrari, Leclerc became the number one. Mm. Vettel left Aston Martin. Maybe Lance Stroll was like, right, this is my time. I'm going to be the, the number one here. And then the team were like, actually, we've got Fernando Alonso <laughs> to come in. Um, possibly one of the best racing drivers ever in the sport. Yeah. Look, I, and again, you, you, you know, Lance used to be part of the Ferrari Driver Academy, didn't he? Yeah, Young Driver yeah. Academy when he was younger. And back in the junior days, you know, I can't remember what year it was, 2015, 16 maybe, um, he battered George Russell. Formula 3, wasn't it? In yeah. Now, obviously, there's a lot of reasons that can happen and I'm sure money helps maybe buying new engines everywhere. Blah, blah, blah. Right. So there's a lot of reasons in junior formula that, that money can disproportionately help you out in what is meant to be a spec series. But yeah, like... His career, like he started early, he's, he's had a lot of success in junior um, formula and he, you know, he took the opportunity that, you know, let's not pretend that if any of us were the kids of billionaires and we wanted to go racing, we'd take that opportunity. Of course you would, you take what you can in life. So he's done that. I, you know, in the same way I've said this about Perez, I'm just like, at this stage of Checo's career, you know, carrying on just getting absolutely destroyed by Max and it's damaging his legacy. Um, I think because Checo's had some incredible moments in Formula One. You look at Stroll and it's just like, I don't know, this whole uh, Aston Martin Le Mans project with the Valkyrie seems like a really like sensible thing to just move him across. And, you know, Felipe Drogovic, you know, F2 champion, yeah, it took him three years, but I think he'd, he'd merit a, a, an opportunity and a chance. But I just, like, from an Aston Martin brand point of view as well, it almost, it almost, you know, because Lawrence Stroll bought the racing team first, he bought Force India, rebranded it to Racing Point. Then he bought Aston Martin, log on, not just on his own, obviously, with a board of directors and all that and different shareholders. But like, it feels like it gets to the point where seeing Lance and him being a talking point again and again just starts to damage the actual marketing brand mm. like power of Formula One, where it's just like, well, no, we just think of Aston Martin as the Strolls team. Well, no, no, Aston Martin is like one of the most prestigious, like, motor manufacturers in the world and they want to grow it again that's why they're doing Le Mans that's why they're present in almost every single form of motorsport Aston yeah. Martin so yeah I just think that I would love to know what that relationship's like in terms of not just personally like whatever I'm just talking in terms of father-son relationship when it comes to motorsport like is like after his outburst like in qualifying did they have a word I, I don't we don't know we don't see that but I, I would just be fascinated to know how that actually plays out behind closed doors because everyone knows that Lance just is not, he's not good enough. Seven years, he's not, he's not good enough. He shouldn't be in this. He the shouldn't Le be Mans there. Project, the Le Mans project seems like the door, doesn't it? It seems like a way of allowing Lance Stroll an ability to make a step aside. It would be, it would be disappointing for him. I think, I think he'd look back on his Formula One career. He's still got those positives. He's still got. Race results, they'll take be them very away happy from him. about. Yeah. And he's still got podiums that he can celebrate, but it does seem like a, a good point in his career where he can move across. And actually, if the Aston Martin team are as competitive in Le Mans or mm. uh, in the hypercar series as they are trying to be in Formula One, he can sort of see himself maybe going across there and 
you know, a, a Le Mans win Giovinazzi. would be yeah, absolutely yeah, exactly. incredible for his That's career. And Marcus Ericsson winning the Indy, Indy 500. 500. He's not remembered for... Then Giovinazzi won't be remembered for his Formula 1. He'll no. be remembered as the guy that brought Ferrari their first Le Mans exactly. title since, whatever, 66. Yeah, exactly. And so they people, drivers can redefine their careers by doing well in other categories. And the hypercar category is slowly becoming more and more prestigious because it's realized, hey... This is bringing in legit manufacturers. Yep. And Aston Martin's coming in now with that gorgeous Valkyrie that was at one time going to be shelved. And Adrian Newey shedding a tear going, like, baby, <laughs> that's my baby getting into Le Mans after all. So you feel like that's good that they managed to get some kind of deal in. And now if Lance can do that, maybe that's the way they spin it. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised in 12 months time you get a statement saying Lance Stroll to move over to Aston Martin hypercar project in a very bold move to bring his very important and vast Formula One experience. They could put a spin on that PR wise, definitely. Say, bringing in his vast experience of 150 plus races to this hypercar project. They'll spin it that way. But I completely agree with the fact that if he went to that series and won, it doesn't have to be Le Mans. Le Mans the one that everyone talks about just because it's the 24 hour and it has such prestige around it. But even if he just won a few races over there, mm. like, or just gets onto the podium in yeah. a few races over there. like competitive. Just but again, mojo, you, you, your boy Ericsson is such a good example because from an F1 fan reputation point of view, Marcus Ericsson does not have a good reputation no, amongst it's Formula the, 1 it's the Roman Grosjean crash in Baku, isn't it? Yeah. Really? That's literally it. But he's gone on to the US and he's achieved amazing things. Yeah, I mean, he, I mean, maybe what he didn't know is that he's a brilliant oval racer. I mean, he was always qu he's, he was always quickest in Formula One around the tracks with the fastest corners. He was brilliant around Suzuka. I think his, his record there, I think, is the best. Um, I mean, same with uh, same with Silverstone. He was always strong. So, I mean, now um, his, his record on on the ovals is pretty strong. And he didn't do what Grosjean did, which was Grosjean didn't do any ovals when he first went over. Um, and then he tried Gateway and loved it. But then, I mean, Grosjean hasn't finished either of the Indy 500s that he started. Whereas Ericsson should have been rookie of the year in 2019 before he dropped it in pit lane Qualif um, qualified outside the, the qualified in the, I think he's qualified in the top 10 in every start that he's had in the Indy 500 and then he should have been on the podium in 2021 but ran out of fuel like Scott Dixon did and then he won in 22 and should have won in 23 and I mean that's that's a pretty good record for that's a crazy it's, I mean record. and you come up and you, the drivers that you're coming up against I mean I know IndyCar has a reputation for not having great drivers but I mean they for for what they are on ovals I mean someone like a Joseph Newgarn and Pato Award these are cutthroat racing drivers mm. at 230 plus miles an hour I mean there is no room for error so yeah I mean drivers can easily redefine their legacies because yeah I mean, there, there's no reason why Antonio Giovinazzi should be remembered for for driving three of the worst Alfa Romeos around yeah. the back and scrabbling yeah. for points when yeah. in fact he's one of the three in, with, with Antonio Fuoco and I can't remember who the other one was that brought mm. Ferrari back there first Le Mans and, and that's what he'll be remembered for and, and, and for doing a brilliant job well the Ferrari so. F1 team had literally a livery to commemorate yeah. Joe Yeah, <laughs> well, they should actually keep it because it's gorgeous it's that's very good. the right very ratio good. of yellow because last year yeah, you're right. that didn't work this year ooh, keep that back I agree I wonder if they might do that for the S, um, SF24 if they do that, because it actually looks really yeah, good. Yeah, and yellow's in their branding. Yeah. And, well, it's, it's, it's just, not a... they can have a consistent brand now. Yeah, so for sure. I agree. I think it could look really nice. But also, like in terms of when we touched on kind of Sauber and Alfa Romeo, and, and I wanted to give them a little shout out because both drivers in the points, P8, P9, um, for Bottas and Joe, obviously helped by the, you know, Lewis losing position at the start. But, you know, we've talked about, you know, Audi coming in, um, they want to inherit a team. We still don't know what that team's going to look like in terms of name. We're assuming Sauber. Maybe they'll get a big title sponsor on. That would make sense. Um, it's not been a great season for them, but this does put them back ahead of Haas now in the constructors, yeah. which this, there was a big opportunity for Hulkenberg to score points in the sprint. It didn't happen. And now all of a sudden, Alfa Romero got, what, five, six points, whatever it was, yeah. and an hour ahead. So I think I just neither driver feels like that. It, it's hard because you can only relate drivers to each other. It doesn't feel like either of them are doing enough to really put their flag in the sand, but they've kept both of them no, for next year. That is true. I feel like Alfa Romeo at this point, especially this season, it's felt like they've almost been slightly invisible as a team. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, a lot of the time in Formula One, you can grab the headlines for being amazing. You can also grab the headlines for being absolutely terrible. <laughs> but we haven't really talked about Bottas or Joe, which doesn't mean... It's bad that we haven't talked about Bottas and Joe because they haven't been Sergeant Stroll players yeah, levels yeah, of bad. Yeah, yeah. But they also haven't been Verstappen, Norris, Hamilton levels of good. They've no. just been very middling all season long. The fact that they finish above ha or they might finish above Haas now in the constructor standards is great for them. Mm. But it does feel like this year has been a year where they 
I want to say, not they haven't cared, but they know it's a transitional season. They know Perhaps, there's yeah. things to come. And it's maybe why they've stuck with this driver lineup for next yeah. season. Because again, they know Bottas and Joe are not going to be the drivers to win Audi a world championship, mm. possibly, you know, 10 years. But they the know line. that's a way off. Exactly. So, so they, they don't, don't need, need to worry about it. They don't need the worldy lineup well, now. You felt like, I mean, there are rumors floating around throughout the entire season that Joe and Bottas, they kind of settled for because there were rumors that Hulkenberg was going to be brought to Hinmill mm -hmm. after his 2013 season with them, which they they like him there because in that season, he got 57 points. You know, he got a huge, over 50 points. And Esteban Gutierrez there, he only got like six. Mm -hmm. So seventh place in Japan was Gutierrez's best finish, whereas um, Hul Hulkenberg scored 55. That's the only time he scored points. Yeah, 55 points for Hulkenberg. Yeah, so exactly. So he, they, the, the Salba team, they would quite like him back. And Hulk's proven he still got it. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. He still got it. But, you know... Gunther Steiner at Haas, they had the one plus one option and they took it. So obviously Alpha and Salbert, they didn't get that option. Maybe for 2025, they'll try again. But then they also, Theo Portier, what were they going to do with him? Mm -hmm. Then obviously there were rumblings about Joe's contract with you know, concerns about sponsorship, about his performance. That then eventually, because Theo said, I was really close, but then I didn't quite make it. Yeah. So he felt like they weren't quite sure what they were going to do, but then they decided, you know what? But well, I'm, I'm glad they right took now. the opportunity today. There was obviously a big opportunity in Hungary when they just had pace out of nowhere. Yeah, and then no, it that went, was just really unexpected. Yeah, and it went really unfortunate. Well, it was unfortunate for both of them, really, because it was a car issue, wasn't it, with Joe's? But yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I just think that I don't want to see, you know, especially when Audi do come in, because Audi is a big manufacturer, is a big name, and mm. eventually they, they'll, they'll take over the, the, the engine operation. Um, well, we don't know if we'll get the name, because they already own a quarter of that team. Mm -hmm. yeah. so they could stick a logo on it next year they might not want to they might want to just consolidate and wait until 2026 but they might just let Salba be their own thing because it's almost like a tribute because they know in 2026 they're going to take over the, they're going to take it over properly yeah. and I think the Salba name deserves to be around Formula 1 because it's been around for about 30 years now it's, it's one of those names Salba Minardi like, yeah. yeah I mean it's legacy. was they're, it 1993 when they yeah. first came in with and JJ Leto driving so yeah. I mean they, they have been like they're, stalwarts of the recent and they're times. the ones that helped bring Mercedes into Formula 1 with their concept by Mercedes Benz thing so they and Patronus mm -hmm. yeah. and not to mention and Red Bull giving Michael Schumacher them that, that Salba Engineering yeah. giving Michael Schumacher his first taste of high-end motorsport. It's a name that deserves respect and yeah. acknowledgement. It just feels they're like they've been so bad over these last years. Like since what BMW, you know, Kubica, Heidfeld, you know, 2000. Since 2000, I mean, 13, 14, when they scored no points and they finished behind Marussia yeah. was, was, that was, that was perhaps the that lowest the of there. the lows. And then, yeah. I mean, uh, leaving uh, Australia in 2015, they were third in the constructor standings <laughs> after NASA finished fifth and Ericsson eighth in what was, I mean, the highest, the highest um, scoring like position by a Brazilian rookie. Felipe Nazza. And then, I mean, then since then, it's gone completely downhill, yeah. hasn't it? And even with the Alfa Romeo investment, that was supposed to surge them up a little bit, and that hasn't done so either. So it almost feels like they need a complete refresh. And, I mean, drivers as well. I mean, it's like they're treading water until... They, until they, they get that moment when Audi take over and, and that's kind of what they're waiting for I feel like and maybe the opportunity to get two new drivers I've always thought of a, a driver like a Carlos Sainz yes. would would go across to somewhere like Audi and uh, mm. see, uh, I can I can envisage a Carlos Sainz and a Teo Porcher partnership yeah. and the youth and experience the the cool head with maybe the raw talent and, and, and I feel like Sainz might be the perfect transition driver if they sell him a dream absolutely I feel like Carlos Sainz being a team leader at at Salva to then become out. Oh, he's doing well at Ferrari now. Yeah, he's like, oh, no, hang on, getting, hang on. He's getting the I've got a chance of being number one at Ferrari. Yeah. yeah Which I think not many people would have given him that chance. Because everyone would have thought that, oh, Charles is the golden boy. He's going to be the number one. But now people are going, hold on a minute. <laughs> he's actually hang on a very second. smart. And Carlos, this is the year that Carlos has actually said, you know what? I feel like a front runner driver now. I feel like I'm one of the best. Mm. I'm not this midfield driver that just so happens to get lucky. Yeah. So he's now changed his mindset and he's now feeling more and more confident with the car, whereas Charles has been, ever since Paul Ricard last year, mm. scrambling around trying to figure out what's going on with his car, having this huge amount of pressure coming in from Marinello, everyone believing in him, probably not really handling it very well. But now Fred Vasseur's come in because Marinello, they want to keep Charles because they know he can be good. They saw him in 2019 decimating Vettel, who was there 
previous golden boy. So they know he can do it and they mm. want to believe in him. And so they just feel like, well, okay, we're going to still build the team around you, but we do have to respect that Carlos does have his moments. I think the Audi project will have an allure though, won't it? I it think will the Audi work. project, especially with the name Audi yes. coming in. His no, dad's definitely. ties to Audi as well. Yeah. And yeah. also just the fact that obviously yeah. we saw it when uh, Hamilton went to Mercedes, that everyone berated that move. They were like, that is stupid for yep. Lewis Hamilton to move over to Mercedes like that. I'm not saying that we're going to see Audi <laughs> become the next Mercedes and win eight constructors titles in a row. But... Your but point stands. If Audi come in and are competitive, at the moment they've got two drivers that they could replace both quite happily. And we're just talking about the fact that Ferrari have got two drivers and neither of them are going to be happy. Mm -hmm. Mercedes have got two drivers, neither of them are going to be happy. McLaren have got two drivers, neither of them are going to be happy. If you're Audi and you come in with a really good project and a really good car and you can yeah. sell one of those top drivers a seat mm -hmm. yeah. and a dream. You're looking you, amazing. you sell them a seat and a dream, but look, in two in yeah. Yeah. give us one year, next year, you know, if we're if we're top of the midfield, next year we might break the glass ceiling yeah. and then suddenly Remember how Audi dominated Le Mans back in the day? Yeah, basically yeah. they look around at all the Discord and they just put their hands up going. Hey, folks, yeah. you want to be a team leader? <laughs> yeah. Come this way. Learn from everyone else's mistakes. Yeah, so yeah, Keep a one-two dynamic. Yeah, just a be an absolute sleeper unit. Because I feel like Sauber at the moment is a complete sleeper unit. Oh, yeah. And Audi doing sure. this is so, so shrewd and excellent and genius. Doing a slow, gradual transition. Three seasons to slowly understand what Formula One is. Keep the Sauber engineers, because they know what they're doing. Keep the Hinwheel facility but then bring in their German clout and commercial thing. It's a turnkey deal. It's I so smart. I have one slight, and I don't know whether I'm over-reading into this, but you look at um, Societal has gone over there. James Key has gone over there as well, both from McLaren. As they leave McLaren, McLaren <laughs> stonks. Um, is that too much? Like, obviously, Stella's done a great job. Zach um, started orchestrating that reshuffle uh, last year. It wasn't obviously announced until the start of this year, but... That was already, that's been in the, in terms of the transition to Stella and away from Seidel and oh, away yeah, from Key as well. I do, yeah, I, I, I hope that Seidel, I mean, I was, you know what, I was all for Seidel when he first joined uh, McLaren. But actually, yeah, you look at McLaren's trajectory since them two left and there's an argument. There's another couple of things that McLaren, have, like obviously McLaren have also had their wind tunnel completed. Their that's only just been switched on. Yeah. The Very fabled true, wind tunnel, the legends. I don't know. They developed this banger of a car in Germany still in Toyota's wind yeah, tunnel. That's yeah, that's very true. They did. So, And now that they can start 2025 will be the first season where it's fully in done yep. the wind tunnel. Oscar can, Piastri world champion confirmed. <laughs> I would not it's actually happened. bet against that in 2025 because <laughs> I feel like he's going to get He's. I would say he'll get multiple wins next year because if things close up and this ATR penalty... Oh, he's gone out there will, on a whim. No, I'm saying multiple <laughs> wins. That means just two. <laughs> two that counts. That's so, a multiple but one. The thing is, though, I just feel like... I do feel a real strong sense that he can do it and that Red Bull won't romp away as much next year because other teams will catch up because we're having the same exact same red regs next year. Mm -hmm. There's no change. Yep. Mm -hmm. So all of these other teams, they've got, they're planning everything. Red Bull do still have the ATR hit and they've already stopped the RB19, but the RB20 is still the same. So I feel like that there will be some sort of catch up. Things will be closer, Please. not close. <laughs> I mean, Please. consistently Please. 10 Come seconds on. instead of 20. <laughs> <laughs> but, but as in like one mistake from Max, yeah, one yeah. mistake in the pit stops and the McLarens and Mercedes could be on them yeah. and, and Ferrari. So I don't think though, like as Audi come in a little bit further, maybe James Key and Seidel, are some of the first people they'll also kind of shuffle around a I bit. I don't think like, We've seen it with Aston Martin. Like Aston Martin kind of came in, they brought a few people mm. and they came in, they brought a few more people mm. and then they've kind of brought in some Mercedes engineers, some Red Bull engineers and then this season it seemed to like click I don't think with si Aston Martin. I think Seidel so. will be kept there because I think the whole Seidel. reason Seidel was, Seidel was critical it to takes turn, time as well. turn McLaren around to get them to the trajectory yeah. now because he's he let, he felt comfortable leaving and there was no bad blood between he and Zach. He was thinking, Seidel's gone, I've done everything I can now I think now it's time for you, Andrea, to And he had his connections to Porsche yeah. from yeah, before. Exactly. And, yeah, so, but now, saying, now it's my time to do this again at another team. I've done it once. I feel good. I feel like I've done everything I can. I've set everything in stone. Andrea's carrying Yeah. On. Perhaps it's just a comment. It just doesn't fill me with confidence. Yeah. But we'll see. Look, fingers crossed. Audi at the front. I love I love Audis. They're my... I, 
never really Mercedes and BMW. I was always more of an Audi kind of guy. I don't know what that says about me as a person, but there you go. <laughs> I think we'll wrap it there, lads. Um, thank you everyone for watching and listening wherever you are in the world. Um, JB, where can they find you? Not Applicable F1, YouTube, Instagram, everywhere on the internet. Law? You can find me Law VS on YouTube and Law VSX on Twitter because somebody took my Law VS thing on Twitter. Oh, fuming. Either way, but Law VS or if you find me in your F1 feed, I'm the guy that's on the ladder. In the attic. In the attic. <laughs> Love it. Uh, and then uh, I'm JamesNS19 on Twitter. And then you can find me writing articles at singleseaterspace.co.uk. Um, yeah, I write about Formula 1 and IndyCar on there. So you can give some stuff a read. Bosh. Good chatting, lads. Thank you for filling in for Niran this weekend as well. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Thank you. On the Last Lap Podcast. Bye.